Hello and welcome to another tutorial, this time on abnormal pupillary reflexes. The pupillary reflex test is an important test for clinicians, particularly with an unconscious patient. It tells us a lot about brainstem function. So let's have a look at reasons why we might find an abnormal pupillary reflex. So let's first of all mention what the normal response would be. Well, we'd get a flashlight and we would shine it into the patient's eye. We'd expect the pupil to constrict in the eye in which we're shining the light into, and that would be the direct response. The other eye we'd expect to con the pupil to constrict as well, and that would be the consensual response. So number one here on the list, we wouldn't get a response either direct or consensual in a blind eye for any reason. If we had a retinal uh, lesion or disease, we'd expect no response. If we had a lesion on the optic nerve somewhere between the retina and the optic chiasm, again, we'd expect no response. The eye would be blind and therefore the response wouldn't work. In terms of number two, there's a head injury affecting the oculomotor nerve. This can occur through extradural or subdural hematomas where we have raised intracranial pressure and herniation. In particular, the uncus of the temporal lobe can push through the tentorum cerebelli and compress the oculomotor nerve as it leaves the midbrain. We would expect no direct response in this particular um, test. We might have a consensual response. It would depend on whether the brainstem was damaged bilaterally. In terms of number three, an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. Again, if the aneurysm was putting compression on the oculomotor nerve, we might expect not to see a normal response in the eye in which we're shining the light into. We might expect to see a consensual response. Again, it depends on the level of compression. Number four is Horner's syndrome. This is a lack of sympathetics to the head and in particular going to the eye. A lack of sympathetics would leave us with a slightly constricted pupil already, but with the flashlight test, we would expect there to be some level of response. So we'd expect further constriction um, with uh, the Horner's syndrome. Lastly is a viral infection of the ciliary ganglion. And this is fairly uh, uncommon, it's more common in women, particularly young adult women, and it's a slow response to, uh, to shining a light in the eye because of a problem with the ciliary ganglion. So the response is there, but it is slow. Okay, we're gonna finish off by drawing a table to try and sort of compare a lesion of cranial nerve three with Horner's syndrome. So we're gonna put a line down the middle, put CN3 over here and Horner's over here. Well, first of all, with CN3, we'd expect a dilated pupil. And in Horner's, we'd expect a uh, constricted, or what we often find is a pinpoint pupil. With cranial nerve three lesion, we'd expect ptosis. We'd also expect that with Horner's syndrome, but it's only mild ptosis. So there's smooth muscle fibers in the upper eyelid, but uh, only a small amount of them. So we do get a mild ptosis compared to a very obvious ptosis in cranial nerve three. Of course, because cranial nerve three is a nerve that innovates extraocular muscles of the eye, we'd expect the eye position to move. So eye equals down and out and we would have no deviation in Horner's. We would expect no particular skin response in CN3. And with Horner's syndrome, we'd expect there to be a dry, flushed, face, a lack of sweating. This is sometimes referred to as an hydrosis. 
And of course, in terms of the pupillary response in a cranial nerve three lesion, there would be no response. Can't constrict the eye if the parasympathetics aren't working. But in Horner's syndrome, we have a pinpoint pupil, but we would expect some form of response to the light. Okay, that pretty much wraps it up. See you next time. Subscribe to Sultan Brain Hub for more videos to help explain the mysteries of the brain.